Uh, we're going to have so much fun today, and, and uh, we've already, I love the fact that God can, uh, we can worship God in great joy, we can worship Him in our tears, we can give our cares to Him, and it all can be in the same day. It all can be in the same worship service, in fact. And so if you're new here, we're so glad you're with us. If you're joining us online, I can see your comments right here. Uh, so many folks lifting up prayers online right now and greeting one another and fellowshipping. We're glad you're with us as well. If I haven't met you, my name is Shane Schlesman. It's my privilege to pastor uh, we Ag Church right here in Richmond, Virginia, and if you are watching online, we sure would love to meet you in person. Uh, today would be a great day to come, and maybe you can still make it here for some great chili afterwards as well, okay? Uh, we're going we're gonna to have a great time. I'm going to look for the mild. I hope they got signs out there. Uh, I was just lamenting with one of my friends earlier today, like, man, we need some, we need some help, uh, those of us who don't don't do the spice, but I, but still want to enjoy and partake, okay? Uh, but some of you, how many people like the spice? Okay, all right, good. All right, well, good, because uh, our topic today is a little spicy. All right, our topic today, uh, we, we've been in a series called All In, okay? And we've been talking about what it looks like to be all in with God and all in in relationship, all in with uh, the church. And now we're going to talk about the spicy topic today of all in. What does it look like to be all in with God and your money? Ah, there it is. There it is. A little spice for you today on Chili Cook-Off Sunday, okay? I didn't plan that. Didn't plan that. Uh, we just keep the theme going uh, today. But listen, money is more than a currency, isn't it? It's a force, and, and it can even be more than a currency to the point of controlling even. Uh, you, you need it to do everything you do. You can't eat. You can't live. You can't uh, have a place of any kind without money. Money controls so much of what we do. The question is, are we willing to talk about and look at the fact that money could have more control than we want it to have? And so Jesus actually talked more about money than any other topic in the Gospels. Ironically, we seem to talk less about money than any other topic in the Gospels. Uh, so that's very uh, challenging to me as a leader and as a pastor because I, I never want to be one of those pastors, right, who's asking for your money or who's making it about money. And, and so much of our world has stolen this conversation, hasn't it? People's abuses of money and people's uh, uh, view of money have, have hurt this conversation when really God's truth pierces through all of that. Because listen to you, God doesn't want you to feel guilty about money. God doesn't want you to feel shame because of money any more than he wants you to feel any negative thing when you come to him. He wants you to feel encouraged. He wants you to feel his love. He wants you to hear his truth and his grace. And God is the only one who can do that. And why it's so critical of a topic, but also why it's so challenging of a topic. Because we all come with some filter here, right? depending on how you grew up, what you were taught, whether you were self-taught, you were kind of, I learned by my own mistakes, nobody ever taught me about money, or, or, or your view of money, whether you had it or you had none of it. You had a lot of it or you never thought about it. All impact how you view this important topic that God approaches regarding our money. Now, I, all of us teach the value, uh, if you're a parent, you'd want to teach the value of money to your children, right? Because you don't want them to think money grows on, yeah, so uh, we don't want them to just think, yeah, it's just out there, you know, you're fine. I have a need, I get it. I'm like, I don't know where these shoes show up. I don't, I don't know where, how this all happens. How do, you know, no one, they, they don't think about that when they're, when they're coming up young, and I, I didn't think about it either. But then when I was about uh, in elementary school, uh, or probably younger than that, but, but I, 
we began to talk about, and I'm so grateful uh, to have uh, a mom and dad who taught me about money and, and taught me the value of money. I had my first job when I was 10 years old, okay? And I was very proud of it. I was very proud of it. I rode my Schwinn bike. It was a yellow Schwinn bike, too. That's what I'm talking about, okay? It was a yellow Schwinn bike. Got the banana seat. Uh, uh, but I, I cooled it up. You know, I put the shocks on the back and, did, you know, fake shocks. They weren't real. But I, I did, you know, kind of got the uh, laid-back handlebars, uh, found off in other p- parts of bikes. And, and I would ride my bike uh, to a restaurant that was owned by a family friend. That's how I could have a job when I was 10 years old, back in the kitchen and back when there was all a lot of rules that exist, okay? Uh, I could have this job and I got paid cash and uh, don't know how all that works and wasn't my responsibility, but I was a recipient, okay? Uh, And uh, I'm sure they reported all of it, by the way. I'm just saying that that I, that's how I was paid. I wasn't paid. I didn't have a bank account to do a direct deposit with, okay? I was 10, y'all. And so I cleaned dishes, and I couldn't reach the dish. I mean, I was tiny 10. Like, I looked like I was six, really. Uh, and uh, they had to put up, like, um, uh, crates. They had to put crates on, and I would stand on the edges of the crate because how many know if you stand in the middle, you go through it? So I stood on the edges, okay, and I knew how to balance myself, okay, it was good for my core later on, and I, I'm just saying, okay, and uh, so I would balance myself as I'm washing, I'm not sure why I'm demonstrating this right now, it's really not relevant to the illustration, but I learned the value of money, and I, and I love to tell that story to my kids, right? I was like, man, I'd ride home at 10 o'clock at night, sometimes that restaurant closed. In the darkness of night, I'd ride my bike like six or seven, it was probably like two, but you know, by, by the time, you know, I got it to my kids, it was like a 10-mile journey uh, one way, cars were streaming by, uh, you know, all kinds of things. I was on the highway by myself, crazy, and they're like, what, we're nana granddad thinking. I'm like, oh yeah. I mean, it wasn't that bad. I mean, (laughs) and so I learned the value of money. And and ever since then, as this is the truth, uh, I've never not had a, I've always had a job unless I chose not to have a job. Now, uh, I did get fired one time. Okay. So I didn't choose that one. I got fired one time. Uh, uh, Someone they uh, hired, they hired me to replace, just changed his mind and came back a few months later. But secretly, I was so grateful because I hated that job. And, and I didn't like it very well. It was very boring. And uh, I, I ran paint. I ran a paint department, my first job out of college, uh, in a hardware store. And I'm very thankful for that job. Love them th- so much for giving me that chance. But I was also thankful to move on. And uh, that's kind of like watching paint dry. That's what I felt like. So every single job I've ever had, it got drilled in more and more and more and more how valuable money is. I watched people who had money and how they got it. And when I came up through business and I came out of college and I, I grew businesses, I learned I wanted to be my own boss. Right, out of that, right after that job, was well, I owned a business every single time, somehow, some way, from that moment. And I thought, you know what? How you don't get fired? You're the owner. <laughs> and so that's why I only got fired once maybe. Uh, but but I, I, I would start businesses and some of them were disastrous, horrible mistakes. <laughs> And one or two of them were amazing and uh, great. And so that's how it works. But I learned and I watched other people and I learned from them. But what I learned from them was how to get more money, right? Because what we've learned in our life is what thousands of years before American capitalism and consumerism even existed, the prophet Haggai said this to the remnant of Israel after exile, and they came back with nothing, and they're trying to rebuild their lives, and they got focus on how they rebuild everything after being in exile, and this is what the prophet says in Haggai 1. Verse 5, now this is what the Lord Almighty says. He delivers this message. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, 
but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Can I get a witness? Okay. It feels like a, it feels like, man, I'm, I'm putting money in the bank account and it's going out. And sometimes it feels like it's going out faster than it's going in. Anybody can relate to that? I, I mean, it's very discouraging at times. In fact, uh, I'd rather go to the dentist than pay bills sometimes. Ooh, <laughs> some, some dentist haters in here, okay? Uh, so, I, I, I mean, I, it's horrible. And listen, if you got a stack of bills as high, you got to do some revaluating because you're like, man, how can I do this? How can I make enough money to live and continue to sustain what I've created here? God help me. And none of us are above accumulating and then having to pay for it. That's the way the world works. And so we have to be careful. The prophet's giving a warning, and we want to look at three things today that I believe that God's truth can pierce all that is going on, our view of money, everything we've, that is happening in your life right now, whatever crisis you're in or whatever uh, comfort you're in, God can cut through it all, and this truth can be over what the world teaches. And the first truth that is over what the world teaches is this. Contentment over consumption. The prophet calls out something that is still true today. That no matter how much you get, it will never be enough. Now, how do we know that? Well, because you think about, think about your past work life. I used to set benchmarks when I was in business. Now, Listen, there's nothing wrong with setting benchmarks because that's what the world, how do you know if you're winning this game, so to speak? You like you want to achieve something. The company sets these goals and you want to hit the goals. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be one of those Christians that shows up and work and like, I don't care about goals. I, you know, I don't need to all, I don't have any needs of any of those things. I want to be one of those Christians that shows up and works with excellence and says, God is blessing me and I'm going to put my hand to this. But at the same time, who has a perspective of contentment? I don't, I don't, I have what I need because God provides for it. He provided this job and let me show you God's provision right now. He gave me the gifts to do, and I, I learned to use the gifts that God gave me to hit their goals, but somehow I struggled like you struggle. I struggled between these two issues, right? There was always a tension. Uh, we would have people come and speak at sales conferences, and they would talk about their private planes, and they would talk about how they got there, and they would put pictures up of their cars and their houses and their pools and their uh, all of their things. And then they would say, hey, it's not just for you. You're not being selfish. You're creating a legacy for your children. Look at what I've been able to provide for my kids. Look at what money will never be an issue. This is what we're doing. We're conquering it. And the moment you think that you can conquer money, oftentimes money conquers you. And you don't realize what's happening. What's happening is that no matter how much you get, that feeling of it never being enough, the prophet called it out way before we ever showed up. Here's what Paul coached Timothy about. He said this to Timothy in Timothy 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we bought, brought nothing into this world. <laughs> I love this. And we can take nothing out of it. We can't take it with us. But if you have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap that we've all experienced. And too many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from their faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. We live in a consumer age, okay? How do you, 
Are, are we consumers? Yes. Thank you. Don't be scared. Okay. The answer is yes, because if you went to a store at any time this week, you are a consumer. There are certain stores that make you happier than others. Uh, my wife has a certain store. I don't want to give them public, you know, like we, they're not paying us for her to go there. But she has a certain store. Uh, if you want to and call us, I'm fine with that. Uh, no, I'm just, I'm kidding. If you, she has a certain store that every time she comes back, she says the same thing. She's like, I don't know what it is about this store, but every time I walk in, I feel happy. And I don't know what it is, but you know what? It's because they're good. They have created an environment that makes you happy when you come in and then makes you want to. Uh, now, she has control in Jesus and the Holy Spirit and all those things. Uh, so that doesn't happen to her. and She doesn't want to buy more than what she'd be content. With. But, you know, some people. OK, no, I'm just kidding. But all of us, listen, all of us, all of us have and are consumers. Now, how many people, how many, like, it's like, you know, I remember <laughs> uh, this issue of when I, when I grew up, I, I wanted a, my, one of my dreams, this is stupid, I know, but it's just one of my things, I really love cars, okay, I, I love everything about cars, I, I love, um, I love certain cars, I have favorite cars, and you know what I don't do? I don't go look at cars, because I want cars, okay? I want a really nice car. I really, I, I love it. I, my, I grew up that way. Uh, cars are important. My, my, my brothers worked on cars. They built cars. Uh, I was uh, come up kind of with some motorheads who, who knew how to do everything, and I didn't know how to do anything, so I just wanted to, I was like, when I got into business, I was like, man, I'm just going to buy a really nice car that never needs to be worked on. That's my dream. Like uh, a car that doesn't break down, that's the golden ticket right there. So we all know, but we have more than one car usually. Most of us have more than one car. We have two cars. How many people have uh, many cars and then have a, even a house for them to sleep in at night, <laughs> okay? And they taken care of. And, and then, or, or you have so much stuff in your house that y your cars have to sleep outside because it's full, <laughs> you know? Or, or we have storages and we have more and more and more and we all can consume. How many people have walked into a store with a perfectly good cell phone and walked out with another one? How many people walked into a store with a perfectly good computer then walked out with another one? And how many people have, we know the tension in this issue is actually when we care more about upgrades than we do needs. And there's a tension because we, we can't wait. We can't wait for the new, uh, I, I want to be that early adapter in everything in life and I want the upgrade, I want the more, I want the better one. Uh, the new one just came out and, and uh, we rip out perfectly great kitchens and put new ones in or we we redecorate and all none of that is wrong none of it is wrong all of it has a tension to it can you see the difference all of it has a tension and anything to, paul's telling timothy anything that involves money can have control Anything that involves money can have evil attached to it and you need to treat it as such and be careful because some people start down a path of meeting their needs and they get drawn away from that and start getting more and more and more and it never fills up and their goal to fill it takes them off the path they were on and puts them on the path of money and they don't even know it. You won't even know what's happening. So when money's involved, contentment is always over consumption. And if we're not careful, if we don't treat this as what it is, a root of all kinds of evil. Having money is not the root of evil. Okay? But money can be a temptation that leads us off the path of our faith and towards fulfillment that never comes from money and only can come from God. So today, as we're talking through this, remember the words of Jesus, you cannot serve two masters, right? You will either love the one and hate the other, or you'll love the other and hate the other one. No one can serve God 
and money. Matthew 6, 24. So be careful. Contentment, the truth of contentment, should always be over consumption. And the second truth is this. Obedience should always be over obligation. Obedience should always be over obligation. I, I just mentioned Matthew uh, 6, 24, that you can't have uh, two masters. Now, what happens is obligation, the more we get, the more obligated we become, right? Because the stack of bills grows. And in that stack of bills creates a situation that if you wanted to do something else and redirect that money, your money would tell you, sorry, can't do that. Your money starts to say things like, hey, this is what you have to do. When money starts telling you what you have to do, you've created an obligation. Now, I'm not saying that every obligation is a problem. I'm saying that every obligation could potentially get in the way of obedience. Because if God called you, what would you do? When my wife and I were in business, we, we uh, decided that, God, we were, we were in ministry, and then we went back to business. And when we did that, I thought, God, I don't know if, what God's doing. <laughs> so we want to live and maintain a lifestyle that could be sustained in ministry if God ever did that. Because if God called me back to ministry or, or that, I knew that would be a huge adjustment. And I didn't want that adjustment to make me say no to whatever God was calling me to. Now, that's just one illustration. And I don't know what that is for you. But I think all of us should wrestle with what is it that maybe you would be doing if you didn't have this obligation. If God spoke to you. What would that look like? And we just quoted it as a part of our worship today. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. You will not be led astray. You will not be uh, taken to temptation. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. And listen to verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. He is giving us the second and critical part of this proverb and wisdom is packaged together. But we tend to say, Lord, acknowledge you in all your ways. And if we're not careful, we can leave the money part out as one of our ways. God has a plan for whatever provision he has given you. He has a plan for it. If you think that all that you have gotten is for you today, you will think all of that you have built up is for you tomorrow, and you will assume eventually step into a role that God never intended for you. If you lean to your own understanding, you will do what's wise in your mind and your thinking, and you will not consult the Yahweh that we just worshipped and said, God, you are over all things, including my money. So what does that look like for me? He said, well, if you honor the Lord with your wealth, here's what it looks like. Your priority, your first fruits, that you bring the first things that you earn. Here is a discipline, a wisdom from God. This is wisdom from God. God is giving you wisdom right now. You can walk out of here and go, well, I'll consider that. Or you can say, obedience over obligation. I will obey that. Because God, you said it, and whatever you say, I will do. That's obedience. So would you obey God? God said, bring the first fruits to him. Bring your first fruits. And, and to prioritize. And, and he says, 
give first. <laughs> we taught our kids this. We always had the piggy banks lined up, and we would uh, do, uh, they would, if they had a dollar, 10 cents would go in uh, their uh, giving, and then 10 cents to the church, or 10 cents to uh, then their savings, and then the other 80 cents. What should we do with that? And it starts off with you kind of making those decisions, right? Because you're like, you know, you're, you're young and you're making those decisions. And later, if you listen to this verse, he says, acknowledge me in everything. Trust me. It starts with trust. It leads to acknowledgement. And then it leads to a pathway of what you do. And then it goes to your money. And when, you're, when it comes to whatever you're accumulating in life, if you give the first fruits to God, God says this. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. This is not a get rich quick scheme that God is giving. He is describing his blessing. And when God describes his blessing, especially in the Old Testament, he talks about, and in the New Testament, he talks about within a context that they understood. You want your barns filled? You want your, uh, your wine vats to be filled? You want to be able to provide for your family? Then let me provide. Because if I provide, my provision never ends. And suddenly God is saying this. God is saying, if you will think about your obligations and trust me with obedience, then everything that you've worried and thought about now become my obligation. If you trust me and bring the first fruits, I will take care of every single one of your needs. I will be your provider from here on forevermore. And listen, we all struggle with this. Contentment must be over consumption. Obedience must be over obligation. God understands and relates to your money problems. What he doesn't understand and relate to is obedience and disobedience. He doesn't partner himself with disobedience. So if we put God in charge, now we have to ask ourselves a third truth. Not only is it contentment over consumption, obedience over obligation, but number three, management over ownership. Are you a manager or are you an owner? Remember the parable? We talked about it a year ago. Matthew 25. There were three servants in the story and the, and the, the landowner who, who was the master who uh, entrusted them with his resources, not the servants. And the point of the story is actually that the master never lost ownership. He entrusted to his servants those gifts that he would give. And then those servants would manage them for his master. And then his master would come back. And then our Lord will return and ask us to give account of what we did with his resources. And there was one servant in the story who did nothing with it, who buried it and treated it like it was his. Lord, I knew that you would be a hard man. I knew that you would be a person who says this and does it. And, and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. So that's how I'm going to be. And I'm going to be now you. And this is going to be, I'm going to protect it. I'm going to protect what you've been giving me. And I'm going to guard it. And I'm going to bury it because I will be treating it like I'm the owner. And that was a servant that got rebuked. Because how dare you? You treated it like it was yours. So are you a manager or are you an owner? Now, I could teach you a lot from Scripture on this and things, but I think the greatest powerful most thing is the parables. Jesus told a story here. He told a story. Well, I think living stories and living parables are really powerful. And so today, rather than me describe all of this to you, I wanted you to hear from somebody who grew up in our church, uh, who experienced this, and, and now uh, not only learned this truth, but also lives this truth out. 
And, and because of that, she's a living example today. She and her family, um, Lindsay uh, and Kurt, are an example of this. So would you welcome Lindsay Brittmeyer to come and share her story and be our living illustration today? Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot. Tithing, talking about giving away your money, that's not really like a thing that we do in our society very well. Um, you know, if you've not grown up in the church, let me just clarify, tithes, 10%, it's not uh, tithes. This is a funny story. My husband, he was new to his faith in his late 20s, and they kept saying tithes and offerings, tithes and offerings, and he's like, no idea what they're talking about. Like, what about a tide? Like, what does this have to do with the ocean? I have no clue. And I'm like, no, tithe, T-I-T-H-E-S. And he's, he's like, great, thanks, honey. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a foreign concept. So I just want you guys to know, like, the, if there's questions around this, like, ask. You know, people are here. They want to help. So I grew up learning about tithing. I, like Shane said, I grew up in the church back in my Baptist days. Um, I remember sitting in the back of the sanctuary next to my grandpa, you know, because you had to sit with an adult when your parents were in choir. And, you know, you sat there, and I remember, like, the velvet plate passing by and grandpa would put his stuff in there. And, you know, it's all about watching and saying, okay, why do we do this? So, you know, I've learned throughout my family and all this kind of stuff that, you know, when you're giving to God, it is out of obligation, yes, but it's a holy obligation. It is not like somebody saying, if you don't do this, then. It's a gift. It's an opportunity to give back to God just a little bit of what he's given you. And this became really apparent when I started earning my own money. So back in high school, you know, teenagers over there, like, this will hit home for you. I started, my first job was cutting grass. I can cut some grass, guys. And we were saving up, my brother and I, for our first choir tour, our first missions trip to Brazil. And, you know, we're, we're working, we're working, paying a little bit at a time as we can. And my mom was like, well, you should start tithing off of that. And I was like, okay. All right. And so I'm like, okay, well, you know, let's start early. And she's like, and I want you to see if you notice anything. Start tithing and see if you notice any way that God works through you. So we did that. And then about halfway through saving for our trips, you know, you get a call from the youth office and they're like, hey, I just want to let you know somebody gave the rest of the money for your trip. So you're good to go. And I was like, oh, okay. There's God right there. So, you know, you just, it's things like that. And I have notes, guys, because if not, it will just go in my brain and all over the place. But, you know, it's just to say that God will meet your needs, when you obey what he says. He's not going to give you your wants. Don't get that confused. It's not everything you've ever wanted. It's what you need. And that doesn't mean bad things won't happen or hard times won't come. But if you're faithful to him, he's going to be faithful to you in a capacity that is right for his plan. So just remember this, that it's not a... It's not a mandate. It's an opportunity to get to do something that's maybe stepping outside your comfort zone, but that goes back thousands of years. And, you know, whether that's food or going into your storehouses, or, you know, you read all these scriptures, but that it really is just a, it's an opportunity to serve him. So I wanted to kind of just say that, but I also want to say tithing is scary. If money is tight, giving 10% of your income away is a little nuts. Let's just be honest. I do this a lot, talk about this a lot, but it's, it's hard. But I want to challenge you. If you're, you know, tithing 10%, okay, let's say 10% is just freaking you out. Start with 1%. See how God works. Double that. Go to, you know, three. Go to five. Go to 10. Start seeing what's happening there and see if God works with you in a special way. So Psalm 24, 1 says, God claims the earth and everything in it. God claims the world and all who live in it. That means that we are managing what God gave us. None of this income, none of these worldly possessions are ours anyways. God's just letting us borrow them until he needs them. Um, because we are created in God's image, the ultimate giver, we find greatest fulfillment in giving. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Okay, here's another one. Malachi 3.10, this is my favorite. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it, put me to the test. 
I'll just tell you right now, there's only three places in Scripture where God says, try me. So maybe give it a shot. Um, When I met my husband, we were, well, we met in college, and then we were 30 when we decided to, you know, kind of hitch the wagons together and get married. And we um, started talking about marriage and finances. And at that point, I was working out of my own mountain of debt, student loans, some credit cards, car loans. Um, and he had about the same as I did. And we're looking through budgets and we're going through budgets together for the first time. And he's like, okay, well, here's 10% right here that if you could just slide that over to your plan, you're going to get out of debt a lot faster. And I was like, yeah, but that's my tithe. I was like, that's a non-negotiable. It's just what I've always done. It's part of who I am. And he was like, okay, cool. And I was like, you know, and back to the scripture. So if you're, you know, you can't force somebody to tithe. If you don't want to do it in your heart, then there's, that's not, it's not going to work out. So I told him, I said, well, I'm going to continue to tithe and you figure out what you want to do. And, um, you know, so we're, we got married in November of 2018. So then come January, he got uh, was like some kind of extra money, some bonus or something from work. And um, it wasn't a crazy amount, but he comes in the living room. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to tithe off of this. And I was like, cool. Okay. And I was like, play it cool. Don't, not too excited. I was like, play it cool. I was like, he's come, he's doing this, you know, whatever. And he's like, I said, all right, well, I said, you know, watch out. Tell me if you see how God's working. You know, is there anything, anything exciting happening? So I don't know, a couple weeks later, it wasn't very long. He won both fantasy football leagues that year that he was in um, for the exact amount that he tithed. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. You know, and I was like, ever since then, we've tied together. But it's just one of those stories where, like, if you don't try it, you're not going to be able to see how God works. And that just being faithful and doing it, no matter what comes into your home, is just to say, all right, if we do that, the first thing, if it's the first thing off of our list, our checklist, after we get paid or money comes in, it becomes part of you. It's not an obligation. It's not anything scary. It's just something you do. And um, I was going to, let's see, hold on. Go down, go down. Um, okay. I said, um, yeah, we've now, I was going to say, we've been tithing together for about five years now, and I've been tithing for probably 20 years. And I'll just tell you right now, like, yeah, there's tons of things I want in this world that I can't afford. That's just life. Like, but I have everything I need. And that is, that is worth more peace in your home in your relationships, in your marriage, when you have your kids, if things are at peace and your finances are in order and they're in the right place, like tithing, it takes a lot of the other issues away. If you can get that stuff on board first, then the rest of it kind of falls into place. And just remember, I mean, like, it's scary, but don't be afraid to try something new. Just throw it out there. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you as well. Uh, thank you, Kurt, for letting her represent you as well in that story. That was dangerous to give her a microphone and just, uh, uh, no. <laughs> now, Kurt and Lindsay actually help other families. And they're helping other folks and saying, hey, this is what we've done. This is what we've learned. Uh, Lindsay's gotten trained in Dave Ramsey and Financial Peace University. In fact, she's leading uh, a class in that. And in fact, you guys can take advantage of this if you want to hit this QR code. Uh, the first one is, uh, we'll give you Dave Ramsey Plus. It's just free for one whole year uh, through the rest of, through November. So that first one is there, Dave Ramsey Plus. Make sure that you go on there and check it out because there's a ton of resources. Sue and I went through the videos again and renewed it back in this year. And let me tell you, it helps you consider what obligations God would have you take on that is wise and helps you process wise management. Because it's not when you, God gave us this discipline to teach us this the spiritual discipline to, to teach us that not the 10% was his, but it would be a lesson like Lindsay talked about that eventually she learned that all of it is his. So go and manage it better. And then in January, here's a QR code for the January one. You can put that back, sorry. Um, of Financial Peace University in January. We're going to start another group if you want to go through that with us. Listen, as a church, I'm just telling you, this topic cannot be taken away 
and given to the enemy to use it however he wants to and our culture teaching us and however he wants to and whatever the, the God of this world teaches or hard knocks of life and crisis and uh, circumstances that we end up in situations rather proactively going to God in all our ways acknowledging him and bring the first fruits. It's an issue of management versus ownership. I began with the prophet Haggai. I want to end with the prophet Haggai as our worship team gets ready to serve us. So the, here's what the prophet, he began, remember, he said, this is what I'm telling you. Be careful. Be careful, right? Everything you drink, everything you eat, all your clothes, uh, your purse is always going to have a hole in it. You're never going to have enough. So he warns him and says this in, in verse 7. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. So Haggai addressed a problem and then said, hey, listen, you guys are taking care of your own house and you're rebuilding your lives as the remnant of my chosen people, and you're rebuilding your houses, and those are looking pretty good, but my house is in shambles. My house needs to be cared for. You need to, and then he, he said, you are the workforce to provide for that, so go up the mountain and do this work and bring back what you've gained and start to focus on building my house. And then he says, the prophet delivers the rest of the message. I will be honored. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Contentment over consumption. Obedience over obligation. Management over ownership. And this is what the people did. Verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheetiel, Joshua, son of Jezodak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. Two quick things. That word... In obedience, and some of your translations, some they obeyed him. That word is actually they listened. In Hebrew, that word literally means to listen. Because if God speaks, he is assuming that everyone who calls him Yahweh will do whatever it is that he says. And if God speaks to you, then can you do it if you're over-obligated? But what if God spoke to you and said, all of it is mine, consider and come to me first and let me help decide what we will do with the resources that I've given to you and in a discipline you brought him the first fruits and you began to see what God would do to test him. Here's what happened. They obeyed the, the word of the Lord that came through his prophet and then they feared the Lord. And that word fear is not afraid. That word fear is they gave reverence and they were in awe of God. He is telling us that with every possession, it can be an act of promise from God and worship from you. That every single thing if we care for his house. Now listen, this is weird and hard to talk about, but how do we care for the house of the Lord? Well, the same way that he's always done it. The plan hasn't changed from the beginning till now. It's been the same that there was there were priests and now they're pastors or whatever it, it who who are doing the work of God and, and there are people and all of us are, make up his church who provide for the work of God and you see the provision around here and what's happening this is not a plea for your money Psalm chapter 50 God said if I'm hungry I don't come to you for food I own it all I don't need your provision I am the provider but don't miss 
out on God being your provider. Don't miss out on God's blessing that he has for us. God will meet the needs of his church. He's just inviting you to join him. The choice is yours. Will you hear the voice of the Lord? And what will you do? Would you stand with us right now? I want to say that this is not a financial decision. This is a spiritual decision. And right now in your act of worship, I want to say that if any of us here want to come forward today and make this an altar of dedication and consecrate his finances and myself as a manager and say, God, I will be your servant. I will obey what you do. It's all yours. I'm going to come to you with the decisions. And Lord, I am giving all of it in consecration as an act of worship today and have reverence and awe for the word of God today. And if that's you and you want to step out in this place and come right now as we sing and worship, make that your act of worship today.